Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, great to see you all. Um, my name is Eric Priest, and I'm delighted to welcome you here on behalf of Andrew Torrance, uh, Judith Wolf, and myself um, to this James Gregory lecture on science and human flourishing. Um, the lectures are funded usually uh, two or three a year. Uh, they've been funded since 2007. Uh, often by grants from the John Templeton Foundation. Um, and uh, you can see the, the website up here. You can see recordings of all the previous lectures on that if you're interested in them, a wide range of different uh, topics there. James Gregory was a key scientist in St. Andrews in the 17th century, um, and there are a couple of uh, banners outside which describe uh, what some of his scientific advances were. So I'd also be grateful if you could uh, fill out this questionnaire um, and uh, if you would like to be notified by email of future lectures, uh, we've got one planned for the, the autumn already, um, then either email me or put your name and email on the, on the questionnaire. That would be great. So Justin, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce him to you today. Um, he had his PhD in experimental psychology from uh, Cornell University, um, and he's taught in a wide variety of different places. Um, he seems a bit like a Rolling Stone, actually. Um, Calvin, uh, Michigan, Oxford, Fuller, um, and he's now in um, Tennessee. Uh, he's also one of the founders of uh, cognitive science and the evolutionary psychology of religion. He's a bit of an academic entrepreneur, actually, in that uh, almost everywhere he goes, he seems to found an institute or, or uh, uh, a center of some kind. Um, and in fact, in 2009, he co-founded in Tennessee uh, this new organization called Blueprint 1543. 1543, well, that was uh, for many the start of the scientific revolution with Copernicus. Um, and what he's hoping for is a new revolution uh, it, where one's faith will be the inspiration for science and where there will be an integration between um, theology and sciences to try to answer life's biggest questions. So this is um, quite an ambition, and it'll be very interesting to see uh, the way that goes. He's written many books with uh, brilliant titles. Uh, 2004, Why Would Anyone Believe in God? And he suggested that it's an inevitable consequence of the kinds of minds that we have. Uh, 2011, Cognitive Science, Religion, and Theology. And then 2012, Born Believers, in which he suggests that we have uh, a predisposition to believe in God right from our birth. Uh, God of a particular, with certain properties as well. Um, and then 2021, Thriving with Stone Age Minds, um, Evolutionary Psychology, Christian Faith, and the Quest for human flourishing. And he was talking quite a lot about this this afternoon when we had a session with the, the school students at St. Leonard's School. And they were absolutely fascinated. So I, I hope you're going to be just as fascinated tonight. Um, and then 2022, Theopsych, a psychological science primer for theologians. So, um, the title of today's lecture, Does My Brain Fit with the World Around Me? Please give Justin Barrett a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, uh, Eric, when preparing me for this, he uh, told me that the, this audience would be a mix of university type people and general educated public. So if you don't identify as one or both of those, I'll give you a moment to, to be. 
of course I'm kidding. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to contribute to uh, the James Gregory Lecture Series because what a wonderful topic, and what a wonderfully important topic to talk about human flourishing and to bring the sciences and theological perspectives together in this space. We often these days think about or assume that we can just talk about human flourishing or well-being or thriving, I usually use the language of thriving, without any appeal to philosophy or theology, that we can just sort of get on with it. But if we do that, we run the risk of some really gross simplifications, uh, where we might see, I don't know, uh, policymakers thinking that uh, what a flourishing life means is just to live a long life. Or it just means to live a healthy life, maybe a long healthy life. Or we will often hear parents say things like, I just want my kids to be happy. <laughs> and so is flourishing just being happy? I hope we can do better than that. The Western intellectual tradition sees numbers of features, and there are lots of things discussed with regard to what human flourishing or thriving or what the good life might be. One of those certainly is you shouldn't be miserable. If you're not happy or at least generally content or satisfied, maybe something is going wrong. But that's not enough, or that's not the only thing. Um, often we also we see in, uh, in our uh, Western heritage this idea of um, a good life is a life lived in harmony with our surroundings. Not just our sort of physical surroundings, the natural world, but also other people. If we're perfectly happy, but we ir really irritate everyone around us, there's probably something wrong. Or we're massively destroying everything around us happily. Something's probably not right. So living a life that's generally happy, sure. Living a life that goes along well with our surroundings seems to be part of the equation, too. And then there's also a life directed in the right manner. A life pursuing maybe a noble purpose, or something worth living for. In the Christian tradition, we're given the image that we, God created humans to play a particular role in his creation. That we are made in his image, and what that entails in part is taking care of the things he loves, the creation. Both the human aspects of it and the non-human aspects, the cultural and the natural, you might say. And that gives us purpose or direction is insofar as we're living into that. So that might be part of flourishing if that's the theological tradition you work within. We're also told that you know, we're supposed to love God and love others. Um, that gives us purpose as well. And I bring these up for a couple of reasons, not only because this is the tradition that I would work from, but because they both hint these, these ideas about human flourishing from a biblical theological perspective also nicely harmonize with some of the insights we're getting from studying the sciences in terms of well, what are humans especially good at and for? Um, and in the sciences that I have been appealing to, especially uh, Eric plugged in the book, sort of, I will do it again, uh, Thriving with Stone Age Minds, I really lean heavily on evolutionary psychology and evolutionary anthropology, two sciences that take an evolutionary perspective to look at what, how have human minds developed, how has that impacted human sociality, how does that impact the kind of lives that we live, and give us more of a, uh, a how for the what of our thriving. Because if it turns out that we have a mismatch, and this is my thesis, that if we have a mismatch between our nature and our environment around us, that's going to be an obstacle for our thriving, or flourishing. Okay, so that's my thesis in a nutshell, and I want to unpack that a little bit. But to do that, I have to convince you that we really do have a nature of some sort. And while that, some of you are going to find that, that it, uh, sort of an incredible thing that I need to convince you of that, but others of you would say, yeah, I doubt it. Because in all the world we live in, we often think of humans as, peculiarly, I think, as the one animal that somehow doesn't have a nature. That we can do anything we want. That we have sort of infinite capacity 
for whatever kind of information, learning, relationships, <coughs> emotional states, whatever. This is for us to construct out of nothing. But that really sort of runs afoul of the idea that we really are humans, that are animals. <coughs> we are creatures, we're not gods. Much of our evolutionary history, ooh, 99% of it, was in Stone Age conditions, not these contemporary conditions. And that has left its fingerprints on us as a nature, as an inheritance. That always has some kind of a tether on us. It's maybe an elastic tether. We may be able to move a little bit. Um, the camera people tell me exactly one meter <coughs> off of the edge of this I can move. But it's gonna pull me back. And the more I move away from my natural, my nature, the more tension I'm going to feel. So if we study then what is human nature, how have our minds, our brains, evolved in such a way to give us certain kinds of natural propensities, dispositions, ways of thinking, that's gonna give us a clue of where the friction points are that might inhibit our thriving or flourishing. Now that was all very way up here. I'm gonna to have to unpack this a little bit with some real examples, and I wanna start with one that, uh, well, an account I heard last night over dinner by one of, uh, one of the professors here, who has, like me, lived in the States and in the UK. And he was mentioning that one of the nice things about being back in the UK is that there's nothing here, none of the animals here really are trying to kill you. <laughs> Just you know, a quick cultural footnote, for Americans we think of Australia as the continent that's trying to kill you, but we hear that Australians think, no, no, North America is the continent that's trying to kill you. We don't have to, you know, we Australians don't have enormous mammals that can tear you apart like grizzly bears. Um, and yes, we do have bears near where I live, um, and we try to avoid them. So the UK, no, we don't have here all these big, scary animals. But actually, his example wasn't big, scary animals. It was, in the United States, you can open a cupboard, and there are spiders in there that have enough venom to kill a small child. Growing up in the States, we sort of take that for granted. But I found this a really interesting example because spiders are one of at least two animal groups that we have a natural propensity to be afraid of, even when, as in the UK, it's not really a threat anymore. That is, this is a part of our endowment to form a fear association with spiders and with snakes, even if, when we're in context where that fear is not really important anymore. A baby seeing uh, their mother react in fear to a snake can become afraid of snakes after one single episode. That's all it takes. They have a certain preparedness to form a fear association with snakes. And spiders, well, that's pretty easy too. And yet, this, uh, this colleague who was sharing that there aren't animals that can you know, really kill you out here, then went on to explain and share a story about a bull that demolished his front terrace. And that when this bull was on the rampage, he actually went outside to try to sort of shoo it the right direction. That's an animal that can kill you. But it's not an animal we have that natural preparedness for. So many of us would go, oh, I can help with this 2,000 pound animal and try to corral it the right direction, but there's a spider out there, forget it. I'm like, really? <laughs> that was the spider, by the way. <laughs> no, it's hard to catch that. I really didn't see it. But that's just an example of how we're prepared to form some kinds of associations. We're prepared to think and feel certain types of things as opposed to others because of our evolutionary history. That in our ancestral past, especially our children would have been vulnerable to snakes and spiders and they should really form easily a fear association there and avoid them. Because they're little enough that that venom can take them down, all right? And those are the kinds of things that, kinds of animals that operate under stealth. They're not big, huge things that everybody saw and said, yeah, stay away from the raging bull. Uh, no, the kid needs their own instinct to sort of get away from that. That's just one example. There are lots of examples of these natural propensities, dispositions that we have. Um, 
that if we pay attention to those, if we learn more about them, we can see how they kind of bump up against things that we're trying to do in our new environments. Um, Robert Macaulay was a philosopher and a fellow cognitive scientist of religion. He was a recent uh, Gifford lecturer. And he hopefully has constructed a, kind of a continuum of naturalness. I'm going to have to explain what he means by naturalness here. He identifies a form of uh, human expression as, I'm, I'm using the word naturalness. He uses a modifier on that. He talks about uh, a practiced versus uh, maturational naturalness, OK? Or for something to be maturationally natural versus practiced natural, which is kind of a clunky term he recognizes. Um, I'm going to just use the term natural for that maturational kind of thing. What I mean by that is the kind of uh, way of acting or behaving that is likely to come about without, very, without much um, encouragement, much direct teaching or tuition. You know. uh, doesn't require special cultural environment. Uh, doesn't require special artifacts, tools, things like that. These are the kinds of things that are kind of maturationally natural, or I'll just call natural. It's still like walking. Um, babies inevitably walk, unless they've got some kind of a developmental disability or something like that. They walk. You don't have to teach them how to walk in the direct tuition kind of way of the, OK, first you, uh, you know, your flex six, your, your quadriceps, pull that leg up, and then you, you move it like this. You, know, you don't do any of that, right? They just kind of toggle around until they figure it out. You don't have to tell them how to do that. Likewise with speech, that we don't actually teach our children you know, what are verbs and nouns and how to conjugate the verbs and how to put a sentence together grammatically. We just talk around them and they pick it up. It's then that these are very natural, maturationally natural types of, of traits. And Macaulay observes that these are the kinds of traits, too, that we all develop a certain degree of fluency, automaticity, and ease about them. And that it's kind of peculiar even to talk about there being at least much differentiation amongst a population of who's good at it and who isn't. I mean, yeah, some people are better talkers than others in terms of speed, but we all do just fine things. And it would be very strange to say, look, now he walks really well. Look at that walking. That's just admirable walking. I wish I could walk like that. It's just an odd thing to do. But on the other end of the spectrum, on this practice end, we have traits that are really hard to learn. Um, if they ever get to fluency, automaticity, and ease, they required special conditions, special tools, um, lots of practice, intentional practice, maybe somebody telling us exactly how to do it. And there are some examples that get fluent, get automatic, like riding a bicycle. We say that, you know, it's like riding a bike. Well, you need a bicycle to ride a bicycle. That's a very special cultural condition. And you were probably taught how to ride it by someone. And you had to practice. And you had to overcome some of your natural fears about getting on this weird machine and risking falling over and hurting yourself. Special conditions had to obtain in order to become fluid, automatic, and ease with a bicycle. And unlike what people say about, you know, you never forget. Like, no, no, my backside has forgotten how to ride a bicycle. It's not comfortable anymore. I don't like it. I don't know if I can do it, probably. But I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> OK? Uh, and then there are some of these forms of cultural expression that are so, I think I'm within a meter, so I'm so far out here on the end of this continuum that almost nobody has automaticity and ease with them. And Macaulay's example that he develops a lot is actually doing science. He's a philosopher of science. And so he wants to make the point that even though doing scientific work draws upon some really natural things, like making observations about the world around us, sort of trying to take mental note of how things are connected to each other, how one thing might cause something else, that by and large, the modern sciences are actually an exercise in shutting down lots of what's natural in our heads. OK, one of the things that we naturally do, for instance, is to 
pay attention to confirming evidence for our favorite beliefs. Selectively attend to confirming evidence and ignoring disconfirming evidence. It's called confirmation bias in the psychological literature. But as a scientist, we actually design studies to try to challenge our beliefs. What would be evidence that would count against it? I'm going to selectively attend to the counter evidence. Well, it's hard to do that because it's not how we naturally think over here. Uh, other psychologists who have studied this sort of thing have noted that we are uh, really prone to what's called a, a base rate neglect. That is, we're really good at, we're really bad at counting things that didn't happen or background conditions and probabilities. And for pretty obvious reasons why you know, we don't pay good attention to these things. Um, and so we might f think that things are more common than they are because we haven't paid attention to all of the missing data, in a sense. Um, universities should know better, but we do it anyway. So uh, one of the things we like to do is, uh, for instance, periodically evaluate our admission standards for you know, how strong they predicted uh, academic success. And who do we pay attention to? The students who came to our university. Who do we not pay attention to? All of the people we rejected. <laughs> so we ignore the probabilities of the base rate there, right? We, well, sorry, we ignore base rate when we're calculating probabilities. Um, and we do this in our regular life all the time, but not in the sciences, right? Again, we have to pay attention to all the data, including the missing stuff, the stuff that's harder to pay attention to, which is why we, the sciences often operate under uh, using quantification of various sorts and mathematical modeling and other things like that. We're deliberately, we've de deliberately developed some technologies, the doing of science, to compensate for or to override our natural propensities and thought. And it's hard. And it takes years and years of training in formal education and lots of practice, and still we make mistakes, and we think poorly, and we need our colleagues to say, ah, I'm not, 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 you're missing something there, because while we love our favorite theories, they hate our favorite <coughs> theories, and they're happy to show us where we've messed up, but that is part of the institution as well, right? But that's all very unnatural. Okay, so Macaulay has pointed out that there are some forms of human expression, cultural expression, that are really difficult. It's hard to acquire anything remotely like fluency, automaticity, and ease. They require special cultural conditions, <clears throat> deliberate tuition, often all kinds of extra support, like, say, mathematical systems in the case of science, literacy, um, other kinds of supports to make them spread successfully and for anybody to have a chance to do this well. But then there are these other things way over here that are just so easy. They're automatic. If you know a typical five-year-old doesn't uh, speak, we worry that something's medically wrong with them, right? Not just, oh, well, that's odd. If they haven't mastered chess by the age of five, even though we tried to get them, we go, OK, that's fine. But if they can't speak, something's wrong. Okay? Think of these as lying on a continuum then. We've got these really, really natural forms of expression. Uh, and language, your first language use is a really great example of that. And then on the other end, you've got something like scientific mastery. And in between this, you have all kinds of forms of cultural expression that are kind of a mix of the two. Um, for instance, Macaulay would place literacy over here somewhere which is interesting, I thought it would be more like this, but we had a conversation about this. And he said, well, actually, literacy is very hard, which is why we spend so many years teaching kids how to read and write. Yes, it takes advantage of that language learning, but then it does something very unusual and special in terms of all kinds of pattern recognition, fine motor control, all kinds of things, formalizing the stuff that we normally do. We don't write the way we speak, typically. Right? We've learned new rules for how to write, how to communicate in writing that aren't exactly the same as spoken um, communication and so forth. Um, and unsurprisingly, some people don't really get it. It's not everywhere all over the world. 
first of all, even though we were working really hard at that. And there are what we call learning disabilities that make it even harder for a subset of our population. Learning disabilities that only are disabilities because literacy is so important to us. In a different cultural context, those aren't disabilities at all. They just don't exist. They would go unnoticed. And yes, I'm talking about things like dyslexia. Okay, so dyslexia is a disease of a literate society, a literate cultural condition. So we've created a technology and expectations around that and normalize that as part of the human experience, which then reveals certain disabilities that we, we wouldn't have noticed before, because they weren't disabilities, except in that weird context. And you can almost think of something analogous. If we keep pushing everyone to do STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the way that our governments are really pushing hard, there are, it is going to, it's very predictable, there will be a subpopulation of students who just cannot do it. And then we're going to say, they have a learning disability. Instead of, they're normal. That's hard. OK, so there's a mismatch between our, our natural psychology and what is expected of us in certain kinds of cultural environments. Um, and just in case you're interested, because uh, Eric brought up some of the books that I've written, uh, Bob McCauley and I agree that most religious expression is actually down here on the natural end of things. Uh, it's not as natural maybe as speaking your first language or walking, but we're certainly down on this end of things. It's a fairly ordinary way to express ourselves. Okay? What Macaulay has done, I think, helpfully, maybe without uh, fully recognizing it, is that he's also given us a heuristic for starting to identify what are those forms of of human behavior or expectation that might actually cause um, unintentional consequences that undermine our flourishing. I mean, I've, I've kind of suggested that there. What happens if our expectation is that everybody is a, you know, uh, goes to university in STEM subjects? That's going to undermine some people's flourishing for sure unintentionally. No, no, this is good for us. I'm like, well, it's not going to be good for everybody. And in fact, it's probably not going to be all that fun for most people because it's such a strange kind of thing. Um, but there are more, much more mundane types of things that are happening all around us. One of the things that uh, does distinguish us as a species is our, our, our hypersociality. We have lots of personal relationships. Uh, that's pretty unusual among mammals. Um, lots of mammals live together in groups, for sure. But they don't individuate, have personal relationships, and treat differently hundreds of individuals. We do. That's a normal thing for us. Uh, my former Oxford colleague, Robin Dunbar, has sort of made, been famous for um, pushing, uh, uh, advancing, I should say, I don't, I don't mean it negatively at all, advancing the thesis that part of the, maybe the primary reason we have these massive, massive brains sitting on our, our necks is for social reasons, that that's sort of human superpower. This big old prefrontal cortex, the stuff in front of your ears and above your eyes, which is so much bigger in us than in any other animal, is, he argues, to keep track of relationships, to keep track of the information you get from each other, to pay attention to possible, to be socially bonded to each other, so that we can cooperate and solve problems that face us from the environment. Because we're not super fast, and we're not super strong, and we don't have great claws, at least most of us, um, or very sharp teeth, or whatever we need to do to brutally survive, so we cooperate. And then on top of that, then we, we share information with each other. We teach. We're the teaching species. It's very strange. Other species don't really do that sort of thing. We build institutions around it. Um, we don't just teach our own kids. We teach pretty much anybody's kids who will show up, at least some of us. 
I mean, if, if a kid walked up to you on the street and said, hey, uh, you know, and asked a question about something, most of us wouldn't go, hey, go, go away, kid. We'd say, uh, what, how can I help? That is a very strange thing compared to other animals, right? Other animals, if they're young, walk up to, especially a male that they're not related to, they expect to be kicked. I mean, that's, or swatted aside, but then we're like, how can I help you, young man? Yeah. Um, it's a very strange thing we do. It's called alloparenting sometimes in the field. That is that we kind of collectively parent kids and teach them all kinds of stuff. That's part of what makes us a special species. Now, I've gone at length of that, with that kind of specialness because it is in those areas, in our social relationships, and in our teaching and learning and acquiring new information, that some of our natural psychology is being hijacked or distorted by our cultural environments. There's some debate about whether Dunbar is right about the particular number of how many personal relationships we can maintain. You'll find in, on Wikipedia, Dunbar's number is 150, roughly 150 personal relationships, he has argued, is kind of what we're tuned to have. Um, and it maps on to ancient uh, societies. And you know, a typical village would have that maxed out at about 150 people, he argues. Again, there's debate around this, but it's certainly, from my view and some of the research that I've done with colleagues, certainly seems to be the case we have a relational capacity limit. Yours might be bigger than mine, but we can't just keep adding relationships. Or they become less personal. They get thin. They turn into mere acquaintance groups. We're facing that now in a lot of segments of our society. In ancestral times, we would have pretty much known everybody we'd interact with on a daily basis. And certainly, even as recently as uh, 50 years ago, in the typical town or village, everybody you interact with knows somebody you know on a daily basis, at least. Even if you don't know them, they probably know somebody you know. And now we're in these big cities, urban centers and so forth, where it's common to go through a day out on the streets interacting with hundreds of people and not know any of them, and they'll have no idea who you are. That is so strange. We don't have the psychological tools for those kinds of interactions, so what do we do? Not interact, right? We stop making eye contact. We stop greeting each other. We learn how to ignore other human beings. Well, that's not building community. That's not helping us. And we're still getting anxiety from that. Now we add digital media. <laughs> Sorry, something, oh no. <laughs> Social media on digital devices where instead of genuine interpersonal relationships, we're getting likes. We're getting befriended by people we don't actually interact with or know. All of these things are violating another part of what Dunbar has argued for is that these communities of personal relationships were developed through what he calls social grooming. And yes, he's borrowing this from, you know, like monkeys picking nits off of each other. He argues this isn't just to get a good protein burst. Ooh. Snack. Thank you for that snack. But it actually releases endorphins and other bonding hormones and chemicals in us. It gives us an immune system boost. It makes us happier. It gives us pain tolerance. And it makes us feel bonded to each other. When we touch each other, give each other a hug, a warm handshake, a pat on the back. When we laugh together, when we engage in synchronized movement together, as in ritual settings, these all give us the chance to socially groom and feel connected to people and build trust and cooperation. And there's some really cool research showing these sort of cooperative effects from very minimal kinds of interactions of this sort. And in the digital world, if we move socially digitally, okay, yeah, on this end of the spectrum, we're not getting all of that good stuff. I'm trying to be mindful of the clock. I can go on for a long time, so you can tell. 
I get very excited. Let me very quickly talk about our social learning sort of challenges too. Um, we seem to have a few devices, Joe Henrik, uh, Rob Boyd, uh, Pete Richardson, uh, various cognitive anthropologists, evolutionary anthropologists, have noticed that we seem to have gadgets for learning from each other. And by gadgets, I mean sort of mental sort of tricks, tools, propensities. One of those is to pay attention to who's prestigious and then mimic or imitate the prestigious people. In the ancestral conditions, this is a pretty good strategy for especially ambiguous kind of learning. Well, who's everybody else sucking up to? That's you know, an important person, and they probably got important because they were doing life well. Well, now, that prestigious person, the signs of prestige can be amplified and exaggerated by mass media and digital media of various sorts so that somebody could be prestigious for just being famous. I mean, they've become the same thing. And so suddenly, we care about, I don't know, what footballers think about what sandwiches we should eat. Or, my old example used to be with this, why should I have to know that Michael Jordan wants me to wear Hanes underwear? <laughs> but it works. That kind of advertising works. And it works because it is taking advantage of our natural psychology that says, I need to pay attention to prestigious people and imitate and learn from them. Because ancestrally, it was a good strategy. Conformity is another one of those biases. What's everybody else doing is, in historical environments, a really good strategy. But not in rapidly changing environments. It actually ends up being leading to really negative hurting kinds of things. And with our new technologies, we get to exaggerate the degree to which there's consensus around things. So there are lots of ways in which this has been going on before, you know, the internet and all of that. Advertisers have been taking advantage of this for a while. Uh, broadcast media has been taking advantage of it. But with new digital media, it's going in a whole new direction. And so we've got people <coughs> seeking the wrong sources of information and social learning. And I'll close these sort of formal uh, uh, comments with uh, an, just an illustration in a wrap up. Uh, recently, uh, I had an eight-year-old over at my house uh, who I have known since he was born. We are good friends. We, uh, you know, our families do things together. I like to, you know, we play games together. We were pirates recently. That was fun. Um, great kid. Somehow we started talking about earthworms. And because I know he's an eight-year-old boy, I need to share with him some very important information about earthworms, that they eat dirt and then poop it out. Because that's good eight-year-old boy stuff, right? He completely rejected this as <laughs> at all plausible and told me, no, I was wrong about this, that that could not be right. And I insisted, no, I, re I know it sounds strange, but really, this is what earthworms do. They consume dirt and then they pass it out. He's, he's not, he just would not be persuaded. So he says, Siri, do earthworms and I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> he called out to a digital device to fact check me. <laughs> and of course, I was right, so, so not so bad. But then somehow, very quickly, we got onto uh, whether earthworms have souls. And I'm like, ah, I'm not so sure about that. Whether they're alive, well, yeah, but that's not usually what we think of as required for you know, being alive as a soul. Aren't there other things that are alive that don't have souls? Well, sure, I guess trees. And yeah, OK, you know, depending on your worldview. Um, but he was not satisfied with what I had to say on this subject. So again, he turns to a digital device to ask it whether earthworms have souls. And the digital device replied, here's what I found on the internet, and told him that earthworms have souls. <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny, it's kind of cute, but it's kind of alarming at the same time, right? Because what's happened is the natural kind of mechanism of social learning by which somebody who I have a 
connection with this kid. We've had it for his whole life. He likes me, he trusts me, I thought, <laughs> but suddenly I'm dispensable. I'm a reasonably educated person, but no, not good enough. I must go to the machine. And why would he go to the machine? Because it has a name and it talks. And he's seen other people go to the machine. And so it's triggering his natural psychology about how to get reliable information. It's a prestigious individual in his life now. That should frighten all of us. These devices are hijacking our natural psychology and leading us into some very weird places. So, what do we do about it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But actually taking this perspective that the more we create certain cultural environments through the gadgets we make, um, through the institutions we develop, Sometimes we do that to solve the problems that we're actually facing, and that's not a bad thing. But it helps me to be mindful of what are the unintended consequences of doing things that don't match our nature very well. Are there going to be problems that's, that come up, not, not because somebody was malicious, but because they didn't think through how this strains our nature. We live in a world now that over the past 50 years, we've seen a precipitous drop in poverty. We've seen a precipitous drop in violent death around the world. We've seen uh, great growth in the rights of especially women and children all over the world. So many things seem to be going so well. And at the same time, especially our young people, are filled with anxiety like never before. Suicide rates are up. Anxiety related to any other kinds of emotional disorders are up. They feel at sea socially. Relational skills are crashing. Something is not right. And it's helpful for us to just be aware of that. Probably a big part of that is we're introducing, we are creating, we are niche constructing, if you will, new worlds that just don't fit our nature very well. And if we're mindful of that, we'll be more cautious about adopting certain types of new practices. Think through, hopefully, a little bit more about, do I want that device in my house that an eight-year-old is going to uh, fact check me on? Do I really want to mediate my relationships with other people through digital devices instead of face-to-face? Do I really want to live in urban centers where I just don't know people? And in fact, I have to ignore people where I can't go through my day, and thereby dehumanize them. Um, it's encouraging me, having this as a backdrop, to, to really try to make more deliberate attempts to engage the natural world. Because it's good for us. It's what we were meant for. And so yes, I raise chickens now. And I, I bought a place not in the city, but out in the country a little bit. And I make myself do outdoorsy things. And um, I see that there are a number of people in the audience who are older than I am. They're a few younger, but they're, you know, we've got some gray hair in the space here. It turns out a really good advice from um, Daniel Levinson, who wrote a book called Successful Aging. He's a cognitive neuroscience. He observes one of the best things that you can do for yourself as you're getting older is spend time outside, walking around. Stay off the treadmill. Go for a walk in nature. Because the natural world has so much more uh, perceptual complexity than our artificial worlds. Our perceptual systems were made for the natural world, not for cities. And we're losing a lot by going indoors. Um, our anxiety, there's a uh, World Health Organization has suggested that part, a big chunk of the anxiety that we're seeing all over the place is due to noise. Our psychology, our brains were not meant for the amount of noise we're getting. Light pollution is causing us to be able to sleep deprived. It's estimated that about a third of Americans are chronically sleep deprived. Light pollution is the number one cause. 
Becoming aware of these things, I think, then help us just to be more responsible citizens in terms of what kinds of um, what kinds of cultural changes are we going to be enthusiastic about or reluctant about? And personally, how are we going to arrange our own lives so that we don't grow that gap between our nature and our environment, and thereby undermine our own flourishing? Thank you for your kind attention. I think we've got time for questions, and I would welcome them. So that was really stimulating. Uh, it's, it's certainly given me lots of, lots of thoughts. Um, when you ask a question, maybe you can say what your name is. You are, isn't it? Uh, close, I'm Evan. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you. I, I had a, a thought um, just in terms of a conceptual framework by which we can think about um, these, uh, these ideas about human flourishing and how technologies flow into that. Um, you used, uh, I can't remember the philosopher's name, but you used this image of this sort of like progression of essentially, and, and because you're doing psychology, it's, uh, to me it struck me as an increasing ability to hijack our, our own ability to use our own cognition to hold elements of that cognition away from itself um, as you sort of move down closer to science. Um, I wonder if, and, and this thought struck to me that actually from a meta perspective this is exactly what you're doing in this lecture, if in fact what appears to be a straight line is a circle when you flip it the other way. Um, where you have this, this ability that we have built into the hardware of our brain that allows us to hold that cognition away from itself. And we've hijacked that to build all these technologies. But unless we are able to reintegrate this back into the base, then all of that is for nothing. Um, and if we think about that as kind of a circle, um, a retreat back to ground, so to speak, um, if that might give us a little more philosophical clarity about where we should go practically um, yeah. in terms of thinking about these technologies. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, look, we can't avoid, our, our very human way of addressing uh, the challenges that face us is to change our environment, not us. We've invaded all of the you know, pretty much the entire globe at this point, not by genetically changing, but by social learning, technological development, including things like clothes. Otherwise, nobody's living in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, no one would be living in Scotland if clothes hadn't been invented. <laughs> um, it's just too damn cold. Um, <laughs> So we're gonna do it. So I think you're absolutely right. What we need to do then is use these special capacities that we have in a way to be self-critical of what we're doing as we're doing it. Um, so that we can at least not either accentuate that gap unnecessarily, making it harder for the next generation, or other species, because we're doing it to them too. Um, you are uh, making me think, too. Uh, I, I put down with my, my spectacles over here. Another example. But this is a good thing. Without these, you know, and probably most of us, once you're over 40 years old, you're going to need reading glasses, probably, as we all know. And it's just, it just happens, right? Well, that doesn't matter if you're not in a world where you have to read. These have become a necessary prosthetic because of the kind of world we live in. I think just be mindful of that sort of dynamic and saying, okay, now how can we adjust that so that it's not, we're not making some things necessary that weren't before. Sorry, um, I said more than an answer to your question. I like how you did that. Yeah. Um, yes, let's say. Um, Leslie Stevenson, um, you've given examples where what comes naturally to us is not good for us. Here's another huge example of deep roots and long evolutionary history. Human beings divide very naturally into tribes, ethnicities, and nations. And all down history we had warfare, yeah. slavery, genocide, 
And now we have nuclear weapons. Yeah. No, thank you. Good example. Uh, you're right. I emphasize the negative. Um, and you rightly called me out on this. I don't want to suggest that, of course, anything we do that's unnatural is bad. That's, that's not right. It's just that we're more likely to have, I think, unintended consequences on basic human psychology, because that's not changing very quickly. Uh, you gave the example, it's sometimes nowadays we're calling this groupishness, um, that we form groups very easily, in groups and out groups. Um, that's part of our social nature. That is part of our, our heritage, and for good reasons, in the sense that in ancestral conditions, outsiders really are should be treated with caution because they may be bringing disease to you they may be bringing um, for which you don't have uh, uh, immunity um, they may be bringing uh, well they may be enemies of some sort so outsiders dangerous yeah um, but what we've done i think in some ways is actually we've taken that groupishness that need not lead to mistreatment out of outsiders just caution and we've turned it as a reason to have been mistreated. And some of that has actually been culturally developing our natural dispositions toward groupishness in negative directions that we didn't have to. And actually, racism is a wonderful, bad example of this. I mean, it's a bad thing, it's a good example. That's what I was trying to say. Um, using race as a category for drawing those boundaries is not natural. Using accent is. Interestingly, and again, if you sort of take an evolutionary view on this, it kind of makes sense. Because in ancestral conditions, everybody was of the same race who was in the same part of the world. So race boundaries don't matter. That's irrelevant information. What matters is, do you talk like I do? Because how we talk is what we acquired in childhood in our group of people. And so it's been demonstrated experimentally that babies and little kids are happy to learn from people and interact with people of different races as long as they talk like I do. But not so sure about those people who don't talk like I do, even if they look like I do. But in a lot of our cultural environments, um, we have unfortunately developed race as an in-group outgroup marker. And it wasn't supposed to be there. In-group outgroup markers are always going to be there. But which ones are we picking and what are we going to do about it? That's totally optional. So that's a good example. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the back there, yeah. Um, all right, thanks. Um, my name is Leon Fingor. Um, and I was thinking about, um, so you make this point, right? But, uh, um, that we had used it, that we had these strategies uh, that we used to get around uh, certain biases that we had. Um, and that, and you also have this example of, uh, of this boy that you mentioned, um, who uh, who seems to have kind of tapped into us having built this infrastructure of of strategies that that make us uh, be able to reach s uh, something you might call a scientific truth um, or scientific fact or uh, what have you. Um, and I think. You know, you might today you might question whether AI systems are actually uh, in line with the scientific truth. But I think you know, moving forward, that's probably going to get better and better. And uh, systems like the one he was interacting with are probably going to give you the scientific answer. Um, do you think that this questions uh, or put in, puts into question our relationship to scientific fact? Um, do you think that there might be sort of cultural truths um, that are useful enough uh, that they should be held as truths even though they are at odds with, um, at least semantically, with scientific fact or truth? Oh, well, that was complicated. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, yes, no, yes. Uh, um, I take your point that one of the, you might say, one of the, one of the really great things about some of these new technologies is we have e quick access to the facts of the matter in many situations. 
like whether or not earthworms eat dirt out of the gnome. So that seems like a very good thing. Um, and I'm not pre prepared to say it's not a good thing. Just what I'm trying to observe is that, yes, and what that technology is also doing is undermining natural relationships and the way that we learn from each other. And one of the risks of that is that we've been well served as a species in learning from the people in our environment who know <coughs> our situation um, and what's important, relevant kinds of information to have. We've abstracted out of that and said, well, there are these, these sort of general universal truths and we can all tap into those. Yeah, but they might be missing something really important. Like, well, why are we having this discussion about earthworms though, after all? Um, it may be, it may, that may not matter, but it, it might. And we're not paying attention to those if we abstract our knowledge too far out of these social relationships. And on top of that, part of the way that we bond, bond with each other is through the sharing of information. Teaching and learning from each other is how we build community as well. And if machines are doing that for us, then we've lost another resource for developing relationships and trust with each other. Now we don't have to trust each other because the machine will tell me what's true and false. I'd rather us be cooperative, trusting people who get things wrong sometimes in terms of whether or not earthworms eat dirt than the, than the alternative. So. Uh, Lucy? Yes, it was a fascinating lecture, and you put theology on one side, science on the other, and to what extent do you think we've made progress in society? Because it's very easy to idolize the natural world, but having been for a walk with my dog on the West Sand, you know, a dog is a creature of a tribe, wants to be with its like, wants to, uh, you know. So to what extent do you think there's hope for the future? <laughs> uh, hmm. uh. <laughs> Sometimes I'm more hopeful than other times. Um, I'm hopeful to the extent that with each generation we have a new chance. Um, we're still having children and forming attachments with them of the natural sort. We're still putting up the opportunity of building community. All of us, even though those of us who are having sort of relational problems, we still have the opportunity to invest face to face with people that we care about. Um, those things give me uh, optimism. Um, there are moments, though, where I feel like there's a real risk that we're going to run away with certain kinds of uh, changes to our niche. Uh, that is the challenges of our, that our environment throws at us and what we have to do to face them. Um, that at a certain point, we're, we're just gonna be so distant that we cannot cross the gap anymore. That's the fear. Um, some of these technologies, I, you know, nine months ago actually with some of these uh, new, um, you know, language interface types of uh, computational AI like ChatGPT, I was not too worried about. I'm becoming more worried about it now that we're also doing spoken interfaces with them. Those are making me more uncomfortable because it's triggering more of this social psychology that then is being used for the ends it was not designed for. It was designed for relationship, not for just gleaning information uh, from a machine in particular. So that makes me nervous. I'm glad you brought up dogs. I, I gestured to how we change the world and then we can screw up our own flourishing, but we can do that to other animals too. Now we've been hanging out with dogs for a long time, maybe 30,000 years, and so there's definitely been some uh, mutual influence in how we've co-evolved with dogs. I think it's fantastic, it's really fun. Um, I've lived in Southern California where it can get very hot, and one of the most sad things that I remember seeing there is like uh, uh, an Alaskan husky walking around the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, just 
like, oh, kill me now. <laughs> this poor dog is so far out of its environmental niche, so far away from actualizing its purpose of pulling as part of the team, as you said, you know, it needs to be part of that team. It's pulling and running. No, it's walking with this very slow moving, probably overweight American who doesn't used to walk, uh, you know, under incredible heat. Or then there's the Chihuahua that, you know, is in London, freezing, <laughs> wearing seven coats. It doesn't belong there, it belongs in Mexico. That's where it was bred where it didn't need a lot of hair because it's hot, and now here it is in a, in a flat in London looking miserable on its own. We're doing it to dogs, too, is my point. Um, dogs thrive when they're fulfilling their purpose, and they're actualizing those sorts of traits that have been selectively bred and now for these purposes. And I think humans are not that different to us. Um, I was commenting earlier uh, at the school that one of my favorite dogs is a, a border collie, a good Scottish breed. My uncle had a, uh, a small sheep farm in California. Loved this dog, so smart, fast, agile, clearly thriving when it had its sheep around. So that's part of what it sort of, that's its purpose. It was, it was living into its purpose. Um, uh, Jesus once commented the people around him were like sheep without a shepherd. I think increasingly we are also shepherds without sheep. Um, yeah. <coughs> Better get to the other side of the room. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, this has been a well represented screen. <laughs> <here. laughs> Thank you, Professor Bett. Um, my name is Christina. I really love to hear your thoughts on this. So we talk about human nature, um, but whatever scientific knowledge we gleaned about human nature necessarily arises out of a, you know societal and cultural contexts yeah. that were heavily shaped by our own biases. Yeah. So sure. we we know in psychology research there's so well known bias of having weird participants, so Western educated, industrialized, and so forth and also a bias towards male participants. Yeah. Um, so we are still feeling the effects of that to this day. So I, I have my doubts about how much we actually know about human nature at present, how much we can actually generalize, mm -hmm. and which voices have been missing. And I was just wondering what the, some of your thoughts on that are. Great, thank you very much. Um, she's just shared with us a common acronym now in psychological research. Uh, it's been criticized as kind of overemphasizing weird populations. And that is an acronym. It stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, Democratic. Um, strictly speaking, that refers to the societies they're drawn from and not the individuals. Um, and it's a fair critique. Um, but it is not a new critique. It's been around for a long time. And there have been psychologists working as best they can under certain kinds of constraints at, at sort of addressing that in various ways. One of those, of course, is doing lots of cross-cultural research, so you, you broaden the, uh, the range of, of populations. Another is taking the developmental approach. So a lot of the things I've referred to, there's a pretty clear developmental arc to these things. We can see how these develop even in children who have not been richly enculturated and then cross-culturally, and sometimes cross-species. So comparative psychology is another way we get interesting data. Um, and then we start piecing those together and yes, we need to be careful about this, but um, and you mentioned the biases and so forth, absolutely fair. One of the things that I think is really productive and exciting about the sciences is that because it's a socially distributed kind of activity, you've got your biases, I've got my biases, and you're good at spotting my biases, and I'm good at spotting your biases, and we have to fight about it over the data. I, I agree, and if I may add that as contingent on everyone getting a seat at the table. And is that it truly is. That's right. that's the case right. for everyone equally? So that's, that was the core. That, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is absolutely true. Um, but it is the case that nonetheless, we are seeing some emerging kinds of patterns, even as we see data, uh, the, the populations being represented, both in terms of the researchers and the, the human subjects expanding. Um, 
and again, especially, I think some of the most compelling evidence comes from cross-cultural studies of childhood development in these areas. And we feel more comfortable when it actually kind of fits together in a sensible sort of what theoretical framework. What would be absolutely shocking is if we are the, the first species ever that doesn't have any sort of natural propensities. That somehow we went from uh, some ancestor with the chimps to an animal that's brain suddenly does everything equally well, processes all information equally well. That would be a very surprising state of affairs. So that's where it's like, mm, I have my doubts. So, but are the particulars of the picture of uh, the uh, story I'm presenting are they all going to be right? Probably not. We're going to learn more. Thank you. It's a really good question. Thank you. Point. Very good. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Jeff, you're going to talk about the Mary Ann Hey, my name is Miriam. Um, this might be more of a biology as opposed to an evolutionary psychology question. Um, okay. So if you, if you don't know the answer, that's fine. But in the second to last comment, um, you were talking about dogs and uh, about natural propensities towards what they've been evolutionarily bred for purposes and tasks. I was recently talking to one of my friends who's a postgraduate biologist in Cambridge who um, emphasized to me um, the inability to, um, that it's, it's not appropriate to diagnose different human races, I don't know if that's the right word, like peoples, by abilities to think that, for example, one group, one country, one skin color might be better at a particular activity. It's a particular kind of um, bias which we've, which was, you know, I think many even said it in the Second World War, it was emphasized and um, in some very illegal experiments and this kind of thing needs to stop. Um, is there a difference between then maybe dogs and humans uh, or do we not have the same lines um, or do you think there is an effort or an element to which actually people can evolve certain traits and be better at certain tasks? Or is this actually an illegal question? And if it is, you don't have to answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your sensitivity there. Uh, yeah, dogs are very different because they've been deliberately bred for particular sorts of traits over a relatively uh, short period of time. Partly that's because they breed so much faster than we do. Um, no, humans don't seem to be like that as far as we can tell. Is it possible that there are certain differences, biological differences among groups? Well, there certainly are. I mean, one of them that's often forgotten is adult lactose tolerance. So those of us from European and North American backgrounds, we almost take for granted that you know, you, it's, you're not going to be dis discomforted by putting milk in your tea. But three quarters of the world think that's crazy as an adult. I mean, it's just, it's uncomfortable. Um, so there are those little biological differences, but they are so tiny amongst humans. We are so genetically similar, much more so than many other species is my understanding. Um, that's not how we've diversified. We've diversified culturally, not biologically. Somebody can correct me on that, but that's my impression of the, the literature. So it's, 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 and so there is a misanalogy with the dog. Um, you might have raised another misanalogy, and that is, well, dogs, you know, we're bred with particular types of purposes in mind by people. Um, I wasn't claiming that about, necessarily, about our evolutionary history, but I will speak for a moment to those who are fellow theists. It may be the case that God has done this with us as well. That is, that we have some of these special traits that we have because they are the sorts of traits that he wanted us to have even if he used an evolutionary process to do that. Um, I'll observe that they sit pretty comfortably, I think, with that Christian theology that I suggested at the beginning. Because what did I say about us? We're especially social. Um, we're actually maybe the only animal that can really love in a deep kind of, as some people are going to be upset. My dog loves me! <laughs> I'm sure your dog has great affection for you, but can your dog really desire what is best for you and know what that is, and at the expense of what they desire? Um, that's a high form of love that looks like humans have the tools to do and maybe no other species. So just to conclude, um, as a Christian, what would you say 
your purpose is in life. <laughs> oh, you talked about purpose. Yeah, so, uh, okay, fine. All right, I see how it is. Uh, well, so I think that uh, from my Christian perspective, we all have sort of an umbrella purpose. And it is to love God and love others. That's our umbrella purpose. Within that, we may have um, vocations, ways of enacting that purpose in particular times, places, and ways. And I think we need to be willing to let that change over time because we will change over time, right? It wasn't the same when I was 15 as when I am now and where I will be if I'm still here 40 years from now. It's probably a reach. Um, it's going to change, and that's okay. Um, where I think we can get into trouble with um, our purposes and some of these emphases on purpose-driven lives and stuff like that is pretending that our purpose is really narrow and specific. So one of the encouragements I try to give, especially young people who think about their purposes, you're not going to get a deep enough, broad enough, fulfilling enough purpose out of a job for instance. It's not going to happen. And especially out of a job that is on this end of the continuum, so contingent upon very special conditions. Um, so I'll close with just one anecdote on this. Um, friends of family and uh, a kid that I only knew a little bit uh, grew up with all of the physical attributes that you would desire in a um, an American football player. Huge kid. Really strong. He was actually forbidden from carrying the ball uh, in youth football because it just wasn't fair. He just trampled all of the other kids. Um, he's the kind of kid that all of the adults in certain American subcultures would say, that kid was born to play football. That's what he's born for, is to play the football. And we, we say that to kids a lot. Oh, you're a born musician. You're a born footballer. You're born. And the problem with all of those is what happens when you have that career ending injury at 16? Or you did have the career, but it's over by the time you're 35. Now you've got another 50 years to figure out what's, that was your purpose? That's sad. But we do that. We put that on each other. So my purpose is not being an academic. I am willing to swallow that bitter pill. It's not to be a scholar. My purpose is to love God and love others well. And part of loving God is to be a good steward of the world around me. That is presented to me as my obligation. In this season, much of my career that's been in cultivating ideas and sharing those with other people. Um, but it may not be. I, you know, who knows? Two months from now, I might give all this up and become a lion dancer. <laughs> <laughs>